of a few, Kyle. It's going to be amazing. How about this? It'll be timely. It'll be in time for dinner. Okay. I'll have to try, I'll have to try some more punchlines here, here later on. But I, no, everyone did remind me, though. Oh, thank you so much. Um, that there's a clock on the bleachers back here, so this time I won't be just meandering you know, along, giving you more, uh, more information. Yeah, it's right. I'm not going to talk at all about reading across the curriculum. I'm, I'm very sorry about that. I'm deeply interested in reading across the curriculum. I would be happy to talk with people about it um, at some time. But today, when we were um, talking about rhetoric and this idea of connecting students to what's real with our pedagogy and seeing like that's at the heart of the classical model of education, I thought it might be actually good, and at the suggestion of my, uh, my colleague Brian Holt, it might be good actually talk about this model that I have in my mind of uh, classical education and see how that, how that practice of teaching and learning takes place within the model. So um, if you were coming ready to actually stand up and do some body memorization, we're not going to be doing that tonight, but we are going to be taking a look kind of a deep dive um, into the liberal arts model of education. I do say in theory and practice, um, Again, at the suggestion of, uh, of my, my colleague Brian, he says, "Tell me what you're doing at your school. We're, we're trying to, um, I, I'm trying to bring um, a school that we were able to start two years ago into in the line of the model of um, education as I see it. And so I'll refer back a little bit to the practice, what it looks like working with real uh, kindergartners through sixth graders every day, um, and just give a couple notes about maybe what it looks like in practice. So it won't be totally theoretical. It will be down." you know, down on the, uh, uh, the level of the school. So again, I see the clock, and I will not um, keep you all way past dinner, I promise. And um, I, did, I did hear, though, earlier that I think Dr. Mack told me, that, that's okay, you just keep talking, to let's get up and leave. <laughs> so, I hope, <laughs> hope that would be the case. So here we have a liberal arts model of education and theory and practice. And I'm gonna talk about, I say, the logic of the liberal arts, and um, the way that I understand how the liberal arts model of education works, I'm a colleague uh, of mine, uh, Robbie Jane and I, we, we uh, wrote a book on the liberal arts tradition and philosophy of Christian classical education a couple years ago. And we put it in a, in a not altogether unsatisfying, not exactly acronym, PG MACT, that tries to get the, the, um, the, the individual parts of the model as we see it. And I want to walk through those a little bit. Um, as you see the PG mapped there, it's, uh, it stands for Piety, Gymnastic, Music, Arts, Philosophy, and Theology. And we'll walk through each one of those and kind of see how the pieces fit together. But in the largest possible contours, the way that I understand the model of classical education, classical Christian education, is that the, the entire model of education is on an arc that begins in wonder and culminates in wisdom and service. So if you think the starting point is this um, awakening wonder that we talked about today with pedagogy. That's the, uh, the beginning of the arc, and again, ends in wisdom and service. But the wisdom and service cast back, they direct the kind of wonder. They direct the practices at the very beginning. The practices themselves point toward their culmination in wisdom and service. Not, I don't, I don't think in an ideal way, as if I wish this were true, I think this is actually descriptive. Um, when you look at really great early education in our Christian classical schools, I see an awakening wonder. But I see an awakening wonder that is in line with the philosophical and theological vision that's implicit in the kinds of practices we engage our children in. So that's the largest possible storyline of the, the liberal arts model of education. At the heart of it, though, where we spend most of our time are working with the arts, primarily the liberal arts. And I say these liberal arts that join reason, um, understanding, with what's gained through imitative practice. So as today, we're looking at the liberal art of rhetoric, we're looking at the imitative practice part of the liberal art of rhetoric. Um, as the course goes on, we would continue those kinds of imitative practices, but then, but then along the way, be joining reason to them, an understanding of not just uh, an experience of the things, but the understanding how they work and a knowledge of how to uh, use them uh, properly yourself. So that's, in a nutshell, the, the entire model of education. Now we'll look down at the individual parts. You can I, I flip the slide. There we go. Um, early education. I'm sorry for the, the kind of jargony sounding words, but these are actually um, all um, important terms. Uh, seeing early education or education in the early stages as being poetic, 
free, critical, and imitative, and involving practices. Uh, this is the part of education, piety, gymnastic, and music. And um, its primary places being learned in the, uh, the nursery, the gymnasium, or the field. And what I'm calling the liturgy and the festival, if that, uh, if, if that makes sense. And it's this, uh, the idea where, um, if you're familiar with poetic knowledge, I still think the, the best thing to read on that ever is James Taylor's poetic knowledge. I'm sure it's for sale at eight day books, or at least it could be for sale at eight day books. Um, it's it's a, just a, a really great exposition of this category of poetic knowledge. And the word poetic there meaning the kind of knowledge that comes through, uh, that comes through the engaged body practice. Uh, gymnastic um, education is uh, physical training, and uh, the musical education I'll talk about here just a little bit more actually in the next slide. Um, here we go. The, the musical education, I'd say it takes place in the nursery. This is kind of a, a maybe more British uh, understanding of the nursery, uh, meaning the, the, the place where, where children are. And um, it's illustrated brilliantly, again, in Prince Caspian, the Caspian's nurse. Um, and uh, illustrated by this uh, favorite phrase of mine from the Ethics of Elephant, where Chesterton says his first and last philosophy, that which I believe in with unbroken certainty, I learned in the nursery. I, gen I generally learned it from a nurse, that is, from the solemn and star-appointed priestess at once in democracy and tradition. Um, if you're familiar with that, that chapter out of Chesterton's Orthodoxy. It's where he talks about, again, the, uh, the, the poetic, imaginative ways that he embraced by heart um, before he came to understand later uh, later as a man. Um, the same thing when I mentioned Caspian's nurse. She told him stories, as we were talking to faculty um, here last night, stories of old Narnia that stirred his heart and awakened his longing to see those days return. Little did he know that that stirring his heart and directing his heart was the, uh, the work of Aslan to prepare him to re-inherit his kingdom that was rightfully his, and to uh, do away with that supplanter and usurper Miraz. So it, again, this, um, and that would be the, the musical education in the ancient world. Um, it wasn't just music in the sense of the narrow sense that we see analogous like instrumental music or vocal music. Uh, the musical education was in some ways a, a poetic, experiential, so there would be a musical education of astronomy, right? And that would be not the uh, mathematical measurement of the movement of the, um, the heavenly spheres. It would be a knowledge of constellations and the stories that went along with it. It would uh, largely draw from uh, naked eye observation and experience. There'd be a musical education that we might be tempted to call history. Now it was more just learning the stories uh, of your, your own uh, culture, your own people. Uh, I think a lot of what we do with, uh, with children and things like Sunday school that musical education. Um, I, maybe I don't see more, I'm, I'm old enough at least to have had flannel graphs, storyboards, but I don't know if anyone else had those. Right, so your first encounter uh, with, with scripture might have come with a flannel graph Daniel and flannel graph lions, right? And so, and you might have added those things out um, in your class, and I think that that's perfect. That, that is musical education right there, those lessons stick. Those kinds of things we do with students when years later they say, oh, I'll never forget when I was seven years old and, you know, uh, um, you know Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so's class, we did this. Uh, those, those have sticking, sticking power for sure. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think the um, musical education is closely connected to this idea of um, piety. I think the way that we, we learn piety first is through musical education, um, long before I ever actually read, and I'm sure anyone here who was raised in the church, long before you ever read the gospel for yourself, I'm sure you knew the gospel stories. I'm sure you heard stories about uh, a sower sowing seed and it falling on different kinds of ground. Um, I'm sure that you knew the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ before you ever read it out of the gospels. Right, these ideas that we, we learn them uh, through the retelling of stories that uh, awaken our, our minds and hearts to, uh, to wonder. Um, if you're not familiar with the, the work of J.D. Smith, Desire and Kingdom, you know, I know it's become commonplace uh, now in, in classical education circles, but he gets at this um, 
Um, he doesn't use the terminology of piety that much, but I, I think that these, these quotations here from his Iron Queen is getting at it. He tells us that education is most fundamentally a matter of formation, a task of shaping and creating a certain kind of people. What makes them a distinctive kind of people is what they love or desire, what they envision as the good life and the ideal picture of human flourishing. An education that is a constellation of practices, rituals, and routines that inculcates a particular vision of the good life by inscribing or infusing that vision into the heart, the gut, by means of material body practices. That's a really big uh, quotation just to read at you at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but I, I think we can, uh, you know, we can see this in terms of uh, a constellation of practices or rituals or routines that inculcates a particular by inscribing them into practices. You know, I, I think of the uh, kindergarten and first and second grade class at, at my school. The teachers have developed a system of anytime someone does something or visits their classroom, gives them something, does something for them, there's a whole series of thank you notes that they send off to the person. Um, I received one recently. It's very, very touching to have um, kind of spell to write and read uh, letters written to by a first grader. But of course, they're engaged them in a practice of gratitude which uh, I, I guess sociologists would tell us, that the great tradition doesn't need a sociologist to tell us, but they would tell us that expressing gratitude makes you feel thankful, right? And that's, that's a little bit counterintuitive to us with our kind of know the right thing to do first, do it and then feel it later, whereas the, um, the sociologists would say, no, actually being involved in the practice produces the feelings and then you kind of gain the knowledge later on as you go. That's one, I mean, we can think of things like, you know, giving them gifts at Christmas if framed properly. It isn't just all about getting things for yourself, but about giving gifts in honor of the fact that um, the Lord has given his gift of the Son to us as this practice, this ritual that, you know, gives us a particular vision of what the good life is. I think for Jamie Smith, and maybe for all of us here, the entire work of Christian worship is a practice that tells us how things really are. Um, I was uh, telling someone in the, in the hallway today, we were having a conversation. Um, I, I was saying a being able to teach a Sunday school at my, at my church and, and tell them that our practice of worship is how we, um, how we come to understand what's, what's true about us. There, there's a lot of stories, you know, I tell this to the 14 and 15 year olds um, at the school, I'll stand them in there at the church, stand them in the narthex, and with the doors open out into the courtyard and the door open into, into the church and say, that when we stand, and I just want to stand here for a minute and tell you that in the world you're hearing lots of stories about who you are and what you're for. Um, what's most important about you is what you achieve, what you earn, what you buy, what you consume, or maybe what you're an activist against, or something like that. Those are the world stories out there. And, and we hear them bombarded with them all the time. So when we come together in the church, we practice a different story. You're called out of that world right there to walk through these doors and to join this family is the word from God and is invited to his table. That's what you're made for. You're not made uh, based on what you're going to buy, what you're going to achieve. You're made to take part in the great peace that God has thrown for all of his people. And because we need to be told over and over and over again that's true, that's why we worship like that when we come together. I think it's the kind of thing that, that, um, that you know, of course, Christian worship looks different in different places, but I think this idea that God is set as God and we're in our place as his um, uh, creatures who give him thanks, and that's showing the world the way it is. And I, I think that's where Jamie Smith says at the deepest level, where that's, that's piety. These practices, these rituals, routines that give us a vision of what life is really like, if that makes, makes sense. Okay, so we have, uh, we have the musical education, which again is, is about practice piety, which has a lot to do with, with uh, practices, particularly the practice, practices of prayer. Um, kind of putting them together, I didn't say anything about gymnastics. I know my uh, friend, new friend I was speaking to about PE in classical schools. Uh, yes. And um, I, I don't have a slide on the gymnastic. I'm so sorry. I forgot. <laughs> uh, but I will say something about it here in a little bit. I realized that what happened to my slide on, on gymnastic education. Um, but we do have to say something about that where we train um, students' bodies. I, I think, uh, you know, we, we've come to learn. You know, over the years, I, I was thinking at it, I was at an SCL conference years ago, and I heard um, uh, a, a scholar from an occupational therapist from Texas, I don't know if knows Athena or not, but I've heard of her before. Um, she, I think it's uh, 
Ready Bodies, Ready Minds is the name of her, her book. I would recommend it. Um, even if you do that as a Google search, I'm sure you'll Athena you know, Ready, Ready Bodies, Ready Minds will come up with it. But I think some of her research was showing that um, it's children who don't get an opportunity to crawl around enough for infancy when they're toddlers don't develop the kind of core strength that actually relates to delay in the ability to write. And so you think, like, how basic is learning how to write to classical education? And then who knew that the training of your core muscles when you're 18 months old or three years old would have, like, determinative effects of your ability to achieve literacy, written literacy. And you think, like, that, that's, like, just one small example of ways that training the body serves the training of the mind and the heart. Um, we were talking about the way that, that coaches have an access to speaking to kids' lives that almost every single teacher or administrator would would long to have. And if we had, um, uh, if, if all of our PE teachers, I know that it, it's, there's a lot of people doing great, great things, but if all of them had the view of the training and virtue and wisdom of Christian classical education and using the platform of the gym teacher, who knows how that could drive the model of education forward. Again, that would be something that's in our great classical past of this training, the, the body, not just for the good physical health, but also for the, the mind and the soul. This is a, a great phrase from Robert Louis Wilkin. Um, the Church's Culture, it's an essay that appeared in uh, First Things 2004, I think, so if you want to go do a research on that, it's an amazing, amazing essay. But he gives this great uh, definition here of culture, where he says, by culture I mean the total harvest of thinking and feeling, to use T.S. Eliot's words, the pattern of imperative meanings and sensibilities encoded in Rituals, law, language, practices, and stories that can order, inspire, and guide the behavior, thoughts, and affections of the Christian people. Um, and of course, what he is, he's connected with this idea of paideia, we're used to hearing this word now. Um, paideia is the word for culture and the word for education in ancient Greek. And the idea that, you know, if it's true that inherited meaning sensibilities encoded in rituals, law, language, practices, and stories, where is education not happening? Right? Where is it not happening? It's happening all the time in every single direction. Schooling is just a very hyper-focused time of the day where we really focus in on some things. But education is the work of culture. And the reason I put this in is that the idea of this um, early education, the education of high age gymnastics and music, is making the culture of your school. It's making the culture of your classroom. It's trying to order and inspire and guide before you directly struck the minds of your students. Um, it has to do with, you know, think of how important, if I'm talking to grammar school teachers, how important are routines in the beginning of the school year for establishing the culture of your class? Everything hinges on it, right? Um, to be able to have those routines in place, it's, it's building culture. Um, you know, how are, if we, we, I could talk about David Smith, we've learned a lot from him at the Kairos Institute of Christian Teaching and Learning. That would be another, another resource I'd point direction I'm talking about just the practices of teaching how to build a culture in your classroom. So um, again, poetic, pre-critical, pre -critical and imitative practice, that is the PGM of the model. The, the working on the parts, the beckoning the students to what is real that I talked about today, creating a posture of receiving before judging. Um, you know, I, when I I think I mentioned earlier about you know, cringing in certain phrases. One of them is when I you know, hear classical education described as, as teaching, you know, making critical thinkers like, yes, later on, but I, I would say it's, made, it's helping to train lovers, you know, people who love what's true, good, and beautiful, and then can rightly from that posture of loving and um, have a judgment on it. And so this, this early education trains the heart, directs the affections, awakens the wonder of students to have the posture towards what's real. Again, the, um, I think the clearest, best, most winsome example of this ever is Prince Caspian, where his heart was inflamed, and then when he had the, uh, the first disappointing experience of the doctor, Cornelius, um, eventually he, he loved him because this man embodied everything that his heart was already awakened to love. So that's on the front side. The, uh, the, everyone's still living there? We're still sitting on that against him? That's Bobby? Okay, that, that's good. Um, PGM, um, high age gymnastics and music. On the far side then, we have the, oh, I guess I should say something about this phrase here, legitimate peripheral participation. Uh, 
Has anyone heard this phrase before? Oh yeah, I got a couple people down here. Yeah, I had an email from a parent at my school this, uh, this past week and the subject line was legitimate peripheral participation. And I just about fell off my chair when I received it. And uh, it was, and when I pulled up the email, it was a picture of her daughter flipping pancakes with, um, with, with her dad. And she said, I remember that talk you gave about legitimate peripheral participation. And I'll explain what it is right now. It's, it's a sociology of, of education term uh, that a, 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 a sociologist, Etienne Binger, coined. But he was trying to, trying to describe the, um, the, the child who joins the orchestra and just learns how to articulate the D string and like, is able to display the D string in whole notes while the whole orchestra is playing like, you know, Ode to Joy. And then, are they really playing with the orchestra? Yeah, they are. They're truly playing. They're playing in tune, playing in time, totally playing the orchestra at the lowest possible saturation level, right? But it's still the real thing. Um, and so he said it's legitimate participation, but it's peripheral. And um, his research is that almost anything you know how to do, and you know how to do well, you learned it by being engaged in a legitimate way, albeit peripheral, according to your abilities. Um, if you are a black belt in karate, you, you had a legitimate peripheral participation at the beginning. If you um, like to do mud races, <laughs> I guarantee you it's some of this, okay, I can't do everything that everybody's doing here, but I'm going to you know, join in until I can. Um, it was just really funny where the example I used was um, allowing our children to uh, cook with us in the kitchen, right? When it, it's, it's invariably on a weeknight when mom and dad are busy and we're going to make dinner in the kitchen, and then the seven-year-old comes out and wants to help. And everything inside of you is going, please, just let me get this done, because this is going to take twice as long, and you're going to make a mess. But, you know, on good days, when, you know, the kind of good dad is there, I think, this is important for you to be able to help me out here. This is, you're going to learn how to be you know, a parent yourself by, by uh, participating along with us. But we give them appropriate tasks, right? You go crack those hands, or maybe you go do your best to measure out the, the tablespoon of, of, of flour or whatever. So legitimate peripheral participation. There we go. That's, maybe that's a way to capture the entire piety of next to the music. On the, on the other end, we have this love of wisdom, and that's um, philosophy and theology. Um, there, there's a quote that I don't have here uh, from a church father called Maximus the Confessor where he says, knowledge becomes wisdom when it's in service, uh, when it's put into service. And uh, this idea that, you know, philosophy, we know the word means the love of wisdom. Uh, we know that theology is wisdom as it relates to God, uh, his world, his word, and understanding everything as it relates to him. And that the culmination, as we said, mentioned earlier uh, in today's talk is this culmination in, in people who are wise and who are able to love and serve their neighbors uh, with rhetoric that would be with their words. So that um, is the, the farthest, the farthest side. I think what's, um, what's interesting is if the goal is wisdom, and I, and I think a lot of times in, in classical schools we talk about, you know, wisdom and virtue, but if it's really, if the goal really is wisdom, kind of the unified voice of the classical and Christian says that the path has to begin in wonder. Just, you know, a couple famous passages here in the, the, the next slide. Um, one that we've all heard quoted from, from Plato, where Socrates says, this feeling of wonder shows that you are a philosopher, since wonder is the only beginning of philosophy. Um, Aristotle, uh, although he's missing the quotation mark at the end of the text there, um, Aristotle makes just a historical observation it's through wonder that men now begin and originally began to philosophize. And he says, you know, the obvious things are natural philosophers like Thales um, and, and company that's pre-Socratic that like wondered how the world worked and eventually made them wise. Uh, we have this phrase that I even think uh, someone who attended last night for reminding me that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This uh, being in awe of the majesty of God is the right way to begin learning about God in this world. And the knowledge of the holy leads to understanding. So again, this idea that if our destination is philosophy, it must begin with wonder. So that, again, I, I spent a little bit of time on that because those are the, uh, we go to the next slide, the, the kind of big, the big arc there. Going from wonder um, to wisdom, where we could say that the philosopher who loves wisdom 
their the first stirrings of their heart to love wisdom happen when they wonder. And then they're fulfilled, um, not, you, you know, as the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, um, you know, hope is fulfilled, faith becomes sight of what happens to love. Right, the love that begins is fulfilled and the object is finally held. And so this idea that your first stirrings of the heart that happen in wonder are not, they're fulfilled in love and you get to love the thing. Uh, the wisdom that we get um, from, from God, the wisdom that we get from knowing his world. Okay, those are the big, the big friends. I guess I would say through this uh, kind of third bullet point where I say the logical priority of philosophy, like what's, what's most important? Obviously, the knowledge of God, the, the knowledge of, of the world, the knowledge of human history, this, this wisdom that we have, but I'd say a pedagogical priority of high age gymnastics and music. Um, and I, I use this phrase sometimes in my teachers, radically present, where we're not going to be talking about philosophy all day long with, with fifth graders, right? We're not going to you know, be studying the works of theologians with our kindergartners. Um, but those theological ideas and philosophy would be radically present in all of our practices. Yeah, I was having a conversation with a parent the other day, and um, they were asking about some doctrinal ideas, like, you know, where do you guys teach, you know, something like the authority of Scripture in the school? And I said, we teach the authority of Scripture in the school by beginning every single day by looking through the Scriptures and reading from them. And not, you know, and not avoiding uncomfortable things. <laughs> Right? We sing through all the psalms, not just the uh, psalms that make it into praise songs, <laughs> but the psalms that are like biblical prayers, except the psalmist is angry and is questioning God. And so the ability to read biblical things and passages like that um, are actually the theology of Scripture being radically present in practice. Does that idea make sense? Um, philosophy, um, the way that we approach uh, the natural, natural world. I, I think I mentioned to the faculty last night about um, about the doctor who wrote in a, a, a Touchstone magazine article years ago saying that she thought that there was some important consequence of the first time she had contact with medical contact with the human body as a dead body in a lab when they were studying like what could happen. And she said, what if we got to study live people first? <laughs> and we thought of our patients as properly alive. And you know, I think about how many times do students have their first scientific contact with an animal in school when it's a dissection. That, that's a philosophy of, of a natural philosophy that's present there. You know, I think what if, what if they were uh, here it was milking cows or keeping bees or something like that, you know, like living things that were producing. Right? Anyway, just to say, um, not to be you know controversial or anything, just to think how could a philosophy and a philosophy being to be present in practices uh, is really is a little bit more exciting when you're just thinking about teaching philosophical principles. So anyway, those are, those are the frames. Go to the next slide and look at what we uh, talked about earlier this morning, and that's um, the arts. We're talking about the art of rhetoric. And um, the arts are the heart, obviously. We probably spend most of our time um, in school um, looking at the arts, particularly the language arts, and mathematical arts, grammar, arithmetic. I take up most of our time. But think about them as the tools and seeds of learning. Um, I think we're used to thinking of them as the tools of learning. We think about the metaphor of a tool. The tool is important for what you do with it, right? What it, what it produces, um, which is what, what you're able to produce with it, which is very important. You know, the tools of language help us to express our ideas, help us to judge the validity of uh, people's arguments, right? They help us to calculate, to add things, um, to understand them spatially. But they also help us to listen to people, right? The, um, the art of grammar allows me to understand you when you speak to me. Uh, the art of dialectic, uh, properly understood, allows me to like, follow your line of thought and to, and to have a greater understanding of what you're saying. The art of rhetoric not only allows me to persuade people when I speak to them, but also allows me to perceive the needs of my audience and what kind of persuasion would be most helpful to guide them to truth and to good action into a proper scheme of what's good and lovely and a good report, right? So the thing about that is like there's both a, um, it's a few bullets down, but there's a receptive aspect. If there's any Joseph Kieber um, readers here, and we should basis the culture who talks about this, that there's a receptive part of the liberal arts and a dispersive and active part. 
Um, the, these are not just skills of learning, they're also um, skills of, they're ways of understanding and knowing the truth. Um, and the, the way that they work, as, uh, as we tried to illustrate this morning, is they join reason to imitate a practice. That's the whole logic of the liberal arts. And you can kind of see how they work in the middle of it. If we have this great part of education that's, that's shaping hearts and shaping minds and awakening wonder and engaging people in imitative practice, engaging the world experientially, um, engaging the world through poetic knowledge, but then we have this, this vision of wisdom where we're going to be applying our skills wisely for the good of our neighbor. You have then the workshop of the arts in the middle that build off of what's learned by imitation, joins reason to where it where it can put to productive use. Does that make sense? This idea of forming hearts, building off imitation, joining reason in order to put uh, knowledge to productive use and love and service for our neighbor. And that, that's, that's the, whole, the whole model, really, right there. Uh, the, the piety, gymnastic music, the arts, philosophy, and theology. Uh, right down here at the, uh, the bottom, the idea of fine arts and common arts. Um, they don't get as much play, I, I, I don't think, as the, the liberal arts in our, uh, our discussions of education. I, I hope that's kind of increasingly changing. If you think about them, that the uh, liberal arts are arts oriented toward knowing truth, or the fine arts are the arts oriented toward what's beautiful, and the common arts towards the common good, um, serving the life of the community. So we have goodness, truth, and beauty, and we have arts that seem to be proper to each one, each one of those. Oh yeah, there was a this phrase here, this paths from wonder, uh, from wonder to wisdom. You can think about that. You know the uh, the truth we talked about the threefold path, the fourfold path, or the, the meeting of the paths. Now, how do you get from wonder to wisdom? You get that way through uh, through the liberal arts. I'll just uh, just take the last few minutes to see. I know this is kind of um, kind of an, an, an abstract, like big philosophical picture. Um, the uh, my my home school, where I get a chance to serve as um, as head of school. At the Ecclesial School at St. Albans, um, we're, we're trying to put this, this model into practice. And um, Sunday, if you came to our, our school, like dropped in at like 10 o'clock on a given weekday, it would look, there's all kinds of familiar practices. You would hear like grammar jingles going on in class, you would see students learning Latin paradigms, there would be, uh, you know, math facts practice, and things like that. The really familiar practices of, um, of the liberal arts would be going on now. But if you came at the beginning of the day, or the end of the day, you realize that the entire day is framed by Christian practice. That, you know, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, if I'm committed to that, and I want people to be wise, then I want to start the day of acknowledging who God is. And so we, we try to frame the day with, with morning prayer, coming and seeking God through, through scripture, through prayer, particularly through, through the Psalms. And then at the end of the day, we gather um, as a school again to sing doxology, to sing God's praise. Again, trying to write another narrative. How do you how do you start your time? How do we begin our work? We begin our work by seeking God first. How do we end our day by giving thanks and praise for everything that we, we learned and everything that we've done? Again, it's a background rhythm. Do the uh, do five year olds in kindergarten understand the full theolo theological significance of what's going on? No way. Were they absolutely delighted? Beyond like belief, the day that they finally learned by rote how to sing the glory of Audrey? Yes. And did they sing it aloud as in the school? Absolutely. They're so proud of themselves. Um, and I'm even starting to think like we hear some of the Apostles' Creed that they learned again by rote, by participation, that I'm hearing all the articulate words, not just strings of syllables and consonants that sound a little bit like, like words out of the Apostles' Creed, um, which, which is a lot of fun. Um, but also started the day in uh, recitation and exercise. So the, um, right after we, we end morning prayer at the time where we uh, go through the entire curriculum, the, uh, the parts of the curriculum for natural philosophy and science and mathematics and language arts and history, literature, and Bible by recitation and song. And again, it's, it's participatory. Um, some of the recitations are proper for kindergartners, some of them are proper for sixth graders and everybody in between. But the idea is that we're doing, we're trying to do the musical education, trying to encounter the entire curriculum musically before we, we go to the kind of workshop of the classroom, right? Where we do the, uh, the, the, the liberal arts um, learning that takes place next. Um, I say classroom and garden, and uh, part of that has to do, I think we're talking about this with the faculty, with the 30 
Jim Beckman who was here last night. You know, how do you, uh, we've been really excited to see in class of education the last several years this renewed interest in mathematics and science, which is not kind of like, you know, getting in line with the 21st century as much as it is looking back at the tradition and realizing that that's been part of the tradition all along. It's the orientation towards science and math in a particularly modern way that's problematic. And, uh, you know, we, we think that having them in the garden every day where we're getting to encounter things that grow and live and die, and feed other things that grow and live and die, feed other things they learn about some of the important processes and cycles that they're going to, again, uh, develop into natural, uh, natural history, natural science, natural philosophy. Um, trying to instill poetry, art, and song in, in the day where uh, not just the liberal arts and the common arts, but you know, the, the fine arts you know, are there. And then, I, like I mentioned before, the philosophy and theology are present in practice. Um, one thing I'd like to say, though, that's, or I'd like to recommend, if anyone's not seen this before, there's a, a blog out there called Educational Renaissance. I don't know if anyone is following this. It's a gentleman named uh, Jason Barney. Um, and he has a book that Cersei just published this uh, past year called The Classical Guide to Generation. I'd recommend that really strongly to you because, um, you know, when I think about tiny gymnastics and music and, and how that forms the, you know, just the basis, the foundation of education in school. Um, when we teach Bible literature and history, um, do them primarily through musical education, and that's through, through classical, through a Charlotte Mason style narration. So if you want to learn more about that, I know I mentioned it before, I'd recommend uh, Barney's Classical Guide to Narration. It's really, really powerful, um, powerful. Powerful tool of learning for your students if you want to know how to get them into literature. So that um, that is the liberal arts model of education as I saw it today. And um, I, I know there's they, they encouraged me earlier when I was speaking to Kyle that there were you know, kind of questions from the floor earlier, although I spoke 15 minutes too long this morning. And now it might be the fact that it's 5:25 in the afternoon. There might not be a lot of questions there. But to give about five or ten minutes of um, opportunities for people to ask questions if you have. But um, if not, I totally understand this theme of the day. I, I did want to give you this big picture of the model of education. And, and of course, if you're interested in, in uh, learning more, exploring more, um, I, I recommend the liberal arts tradition in the book that my, my colleague and I uh, published that kind of gives a full explanation between these parts, as well in its newest edition, not just high in the sky philosophizing, but maybe some down, you know, on the, uh, you know in, the, in the weeds classroom instruction. Questions before anything I've not covered, Brian. I was like, anything, anything, it's, it's, it's all there. We all have been wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for, for your attention here at the end of the day. And uh, I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Dr. Matt.